the static characteristics of an inverter are properties that don't depend upon time. Static characteristics define some of the most basic operational characteristics of the inverter. They also give us insight into how the inverter works. CMOS circuits make use of both n-type and p-type transistors. A twin tub process puts n-type and p-type tubs into the substrate so that we can build each type of transistor. A CMOS inverter consists of one n-type transistor, which is known as the pull-down, and one p-type transistor, which is known as the pull-up. The symbol for an inverter is the triangle with the circle at the tip. The output circle indicates logical inversion. We'll use ranges of voltages to represent logical values. We need to decide what range of voltage corresponds to each logic value. This choice isn't arbitrary. It depends upon the circuit characteristics. We'll use voltages to represent logic values. Of course, our logic values are 0 and 1, whereas we have many different possible voltages. So we'll use ranges of voltages to represent the logical values. We use one range of voltages to represent a logic 0. We'll use a different range of voltages, this one at the opposite end of the power supply range, in order to represent a logic 1. Now we have here a gap in between the logic 0 and the logic 1 ranges. We'll use that to represent an unknown value, which we call the unknown or the x value. Having this buffer zone in between logic 0 and logic 1 is very important because it means that we can clearly distinguish between the two. It means that small amounts of noise won't automatically push us from a logic 0 directly to a logic 1. We can detect that error by identifying an x. If we look at the voltage waveform of the inverter over time, for example in this case going from VDD down towards zero, we can identify different times at which the output corresponds to a logic zero, a logic one, or of course a logic x. Now for a lot of our logic design tasks we're just going to deal with a simplified timeline. We have zeros, ones, and perhaps some x's. We know when those transitions occur, and for many types of analysis, that's all we need to know. There will be, of course, some types of analysis where we need to know the exact waveform, but in many cases, the exact waveform is just too much detail for us to deal with. We're primarily concerned here with the static properties of the inverter. And one of the important graphs that demonstrates these static properties is the transfer curve. The transfer curve shows the output of the inverter as a function of its input. So this assumes that the input value is stable, and we've let the output value become stable. There's no time involved here. So we can see that at a low input voltage, we have a high output voltage. At a high input voltage, we have a low output voltage. In between, we have smooth transitions between the two. And these correspond to different combinations of states of those pull-up and pull-down transistors. For example, with low input voltages, the p-type transistor is saturated. And once we hit the threshold voltage, the n-type transistor will still be in the linear region. In the middle, we can come upon a range of voltages and with which both the p-type and the n-type transistors are saturated. As we increase the input voltage further, we saturate the n-type transistor, bring the p-type transistor down into the linear region. Here's an actual transfer curve for real inverters. Note that these transfer curves are steeper than the ones we just saw, that's a good thing. We want to have a steep transfer curve to get the solid transition between 0 and 1.
This graph actually shows two different curves for two different inverters with different size transistors. The blue curve is for an inverter in which the p-type and n-type transistors are the same size. But remember that p-type transistors have lower transconductance, so when they're the same size, the p-type will put out less current than the n-type transistor. We can correct for that by increasing the width of the p-type transistor. This makes the beta equal. Remember that beta is equal to the transconductance of the minimum size transistor times the W over L of the transistor. When we increase the beta of the p-type transistor to be equal to that of the pull down, we see that the transfer curve moves to the right. So we can adjust the transition zone by adjusting the sizes of the transistors. Let's go back to our sample curve. One of the basic problems we have to solve is where do we put those transitions between logic 0 and logic 1? We have some flexibility in this, but one reasonable choice is to choose the points at which the slope of the transfer curve is equal to minus 1. There are two of those points. One of them gives us the boundary of the logic high. So any voltage above this value we should count as a logic 1. The second point is at the other end of the transfer curve and so this gives us the upper bound on the logic 0 range. So now we have two different voltages of interest for both of these points. Let's concentrate on the case in which the input is high and the output is low. We call that input voltage at this transition point VIH, or V input high. The output voltage it produces is VOL, for V output low. Similarly, at the other end of the transfer curve, we have VIL for the input low voltage and VOH for the output high voltage. Noise margins tell us about the immunity of the inverter to disturbances at its input. These input and output voltage levels are particularly important for making sure that two gates can talk to each other. In the case of low voltages, we want the output low voltage of the first inverter to be lower than the input low voltage of the second inverter. That guarantees that any time the first inverter thinks that it's putting out a logic zero, the second inverter will read that value as a logic zero. Similarly, we want the output high voltage for the first inverter to be greater than the input high voltage of the second inverter. That guarantees that the second inverter will read any voltage that the first inverter thinks is a logic one as a logic one. One good way to analyze the static characteristics of the inverter is using the middle voltage. That's the voltage right at the middle of the transfer curve. So our first step in analyzing the middle voltage is to recognize that the two transistor gates are connected to each other. We also know that the drain currents are equal because the two transistors are connected in series and we know that the sum of the drain to source voltages the two transistors add up to the power supply voltage. So now we can substitute in the drain current equations and solve for the middle voltage. You can see that this depends upon the square root of the ratio of the betas of the two transistors. To summarize, the CMOS inverter consists of an n-type pull-down transistor and a p-type pull-up transistor. We use ranges of voltages to represent logic zeros and ones. An intermediate range of voltages represents an unknown or x value. The inverter's transfer curve helps us determine what ranges of voltages should be used for each logic value. Noise margins tell us about the immunity of the inverter to disturbances at its input.